CIA Western Washington Chapter um, Program Committee. Um, we also have several of us, uh, Shannon, Marco, who will make it, Steve, of course. So um, by, um, by exit, so as much uh, as I love design build, the innovation and also the efficiencies of design build delivery, I also observed some challenges as the rest of us did. So by accident, I ran into blockchain. The technology behind the digital currency, Bitcoin, and also a group of innovative minds who put engineering in the perspective of the blockchain. So uh, Dan Robel, Mr. Dan Robles, founder and the CEO of IEBC, he um, is the first person I know who led um, engineering blockchain consortium. So Dan has bachelor degree in mechanical engineering and also an MBA from Seattle University. His career spans uh, multiple industries from aerospace to construction. And he, uh, his project include um, US satellite, US space shuttle, commercial satellites and commercial aircrafts and also uh, multiple residential, uh, m multiple uh, family residential constructions. So I just read briefly because I couldn't remember. <laughs> 2007, in 2015, Dan led the two, uh, National Society of Professional Engineers, integration of the engineering profession of blockchain technology for both the National Society of Professional Engineers and also National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So in 2017, the IEBC won the American Society of Civil Engineer Grand Challenge Innovation Contest in the IOT and the Best Value Categories. So today we're about to explore how the characteristics of blockchain could help us solve the trust issue in design build and also bring out the best of the team. So without further ado, let's join me in welcoming Mr. Robos. How's the mic working? Not at all. Oh. Okay, I've turned it on and maybe the, we could turn on the, um, oh I can use it. Okay, so thank you for coming. I commend you on your willingness to, to jump down this rabbit hole because this is a really interesting topic. It's, um, it's very, very popular in the finance domain. And there's reasons for that, and what I'll, what I'll show you. The engineers started looking at this back in 2015 when we noticed that the actual mechanics of the blockchain, this is this this computer program simulates very much what an engineering stamp does. The engineering stamp seals a drawing. It converts a building from a pile of sticks into a fungible asset at the point of sealing. And, and, and these are these are very. This is what the engineering profession does. We noticed the same things happening with the way this computer was doing. So we started looking at it. And so this, this conversation is going to be centric to engineering slightly, but I'm going to really, really make it simple and, and take out all the chafe because there's, there's a part two to this where we can start talking about some of the, the mathematics are just daunting behind these things, and we're not going to go into any of that. But there's other opportunities, economic opportunities, and, and things that will arise from the use of blockchain, and we are predicting those to be significant for the um, construction industry. Yeah, this works too. Instant death. Okay, so the opening statement for this presentation, I'm taking this literally, is design build um, continues to evolve, and, and this is uh, this is very important. You're noticing this. Things are that we should be doing or thinking about differently to update our systems. To match, contract, to, to match our contractual ties. So you're looking for improvements. You're, you're looking for efficiencies. 
And, and this is very important. So what are the fail-safes to ensure full transparency and, col uh, and co collaboration even if a project is struggling? And, and fail-safes is, is very important because, you know, in our world, things, when things fail, they go boom. And, and people get hurt, and real money gets spent. So this isn't, uh, these aren't just contracts or like a, you know financial contracts that can be reversed at the whim of an attorney. These are these are real events in real life and physical space. So we have to take this very very seriously. Uh, could blockchain be a solution? Um, at this point, I would say that blockchain should be a servant, not a master. And I'll, you'll you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. So. Um, Things are changing very much, and um, if you think that things are changing in your industry, look at what's changing in other industries. Um, Amazon, for example, they build rockets. This is this is uh, this is amazing. Um, this the term complex system integration. I first heard it at Boeing many years ago. Boeing was trying to convert their organization from a design of an aircraft design build to a complex system um, integration. It cost them an enormous amount of money to accomplish this, but they did, and now they're, they're unbeatable almost. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the goal. In order to do that, you have to be able to integrate all these components. It's not just design and build, it's the suppliers, the, the global suppliers, the media, the information systems, the customer service, transportation, and it takes a lot and a lot of money to do this. And Amazon, um, they could easily buy uh, a large AEC right now and, and go into and start building stuff. They, there's nothing stopping them from doing this. So this is what a lot of the some of the, the CEOs are looking at what's on the horizon, what the Uberization of engineering, the, the, um, the new uh, uh, entries, people who could just jump into a profession and build things faster, quicker. I mean, NASA has a $19 billion, billion dollar budget. Jeff, is, Jeff Bezos is spending one or two billion a year on this project. He's got enough money to fund this thing for 60 years, as long as NASA has been around. So these are serious, serious changes that we're all going to have to adapt to. We'll have to move up in the ecosystem. Um, so I looked at your website, and what you're trying to do is, Design Build is trying to simulate a closed corporation, because you have all these suppliers, they're distributed all over the place. You have you know, construction uh, people, you've got the workers, you've got the, the electrical union, you've got the designers, the builders, you've got the architects, the inspectors, everybody's sort of spread all over the place, and you're trying to get them under the same contractual um, a set of rules so that we can integrate better. So you're trying to simulate a corporation without actually being a corporation. And this is, and this is what, um, it, the things that a corporation has is it, it's a trusted system. So if somebody shows up with the company badge, you don't have to you know, question who they are. They've got the badge, they can pass through the door. The vision of responsibility, if they, they say who they are, there's a, you can look them up on the company registry and you can find out uh, they have a responsibility to make the, the decision they're making. The network effects, what happens here today among us, these conversations are very, very important components of the knowledge transfer for building a corporation or anything. Um, and you need to have a common ontology, that means everybody's speaking the same language. You have to have a common database, common servers, and aligned interests. Okay, these are what corporations have, and these are what you're trying to improve in your operations. Now, having done a little bit more research, I asked what are the problems that Design Build is facing? And these are what we came up with, or this is what I was told. Um, there's a lack of timely decision making. There's competing priorities. Um, Unrealistic un, un, uh, expectations are presented early without the proper feasibility studies. The, the, the pace of design and construction is, is at odds with the permitting people, okay? So these two databases aren't talking to each other. There's a lack of discussion among the ownerships. Contractors are, are not providing enough information or even the full picture. Owners are figuring that things will work out. Just In the end, everything will be just fine. And that may not be a, um, a viable um, assumption. Um, and then designers may, might be overselling the things that they're trying to do. So everybody's acting. Um, correctly, but you still have these disconnects. These are frictions in between points, and, and we call them nodes. So each one of you is a node, and there's a branch between each one of you. So these, there's frictions, and there's incentives that are, that are impacting those communications. And the idea is to build a system of incentives that, that could correct that. And this is what a corporation has, often in a punitive manner, which means you lose your job if you don't do things right. Um, but what if we could do that in a positive manner, meaning that you're rewarded for actually having the aligned incentives? So we're looking at how can a blockchain help these things? 
Well, the blockchain is a database technology. It's all it is. It's a computer. And it, 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 with, it allows uh, for multiple non-trusting writers to modify it directly. I'm going to go through each one of these points in a little bit more detail. Blockchains truly shine where there's some interaction between the transactions. This is a fancy word of saying critical path. So if one transaction depends on another thing happening first, then blockchain is like this big metronome. It, it puts a cadence on the entire project so that things can be synchronized in time. Really, really slick. Uh, the database contains embedded rules that restrict transactions performed. So there's rules that won't let me go through into the finance department and write myself a check. There's rules that won't let me change the terms of, a, of an insurance agreement because the database is, is programmed to allow certain things. Um, a blockchain's job is to be the authoritative final transaction log. So if you're worried about revisions to your BIM model, well, what's showing up in the blockchain, that's the one that everybody has to agree to no matter what anybody says. So these sound really cool, right? These are really cool things to have. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit more than, than that. There's some difficulties, some challenges to be encountered. Um, but let me talk about what the me mechanism of blockchain is and, and what problem does blockchain actually solve. Um, it solves a handshake problem. The thing is that computers are really, really good at copying things but they're not good at not copying things. So if I give Joan a, a contract, she has a valid version of the contract, and so do I, over email, a paper contract. So she can change terms, and I can change terms, and there's no way to figure out which is the valid contract. In fact, you can duplicate that, that contract a million times, and you don't know which is the valid one because computers are not able to not copy it. Okay, so this is, this is the, the big problem. It appears in finance with the double spend. When I, when I send, the, have you ever heard of, um, of dual entry accounting? So if I send you a, a transaction, I've got to take that off my books and put it in your hands. So taking it off the books is the problem. So uh, let me just demonstrate really quick um, how the handshake came about. Can, can would you say that please? Okay, in the old times, when, in old markets, okay, say it's 1500s and we're all doing a transaction, she, has, um, she raises chickens and I, and I raise corn. And we meet in the, central, um, in the central square. We don't know each other. Okay, so I, I want to buy the chickens and she's interested in the corn. So what we do is we hold hands. I put the corn on the table, she puts the chicken on the table. I inspect the chicken and she inspects the corn and she can't run away and I can't run away because we're holding each other's hands. The, corn, and the chicken is still is alive and breathing, the corn isn't rotten and full of insects. And once we both agree, we let go and we take our product and leave. In front of all of you people as our witness, it's very difficult to reverse this transaction. If I came back later and said, look, you know, I decide I don't want this, you know, this corn anymore or these chickens anymore, you say no. You know, the, everybody saw that. It was proven. It was demonstrated. And, and this is this is the this is what a, a computer program can now do. In fact, blockchain is a really really clumsy dance that a computer has to do in order to simulate that transaction that people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. Okay, the computer is doing a clumsy dance in order to copy that. So I'm going to talk about that clumsy dance a little bit. And this is the only technical part about this. You look at blockchain as a series of vaults, a chain of vaults. We'll call them blocks, we'll call them vaults. But they're kind of moving along. And the computer makes three rules. The combination for each locker is stored in the prior locker. Okay, each combination can only be used once. No two lockers can be opened at the same time. So these are very simple rules for a computer to enforce. Okay, so what happens is, I want to get what's in that locker. Well, I have to have the other locker open. So the other locker is open. I take the combination and I try to open it. It doesn't open. Why? Because this is still open. So I got to shut that door first. And then I got to open this one. I take that key out. I, this is no longer useful. I got to put that one in this one. And we have to go through this dance. And this assures that the blockchain can only go in one direction. It's like a check valve. Okay, imagine where we would be if we'd never invented the check valve. We could never deliver water to the 76th floor of a structure without a check valve. Okay, so this is a very, it's a very important device that we can now add to our suite of circuits, of, of interpersonal circuits. That the transaction can only go in one direction, it cannot ever go in reverse. So how, who's running this thing, who's running this computer, and what's keeping them from being corrupted? Okay, so if somebody's running this blockchain, 
Why can't they be bought off? Well, the, what Bitcoin does is that it uses a disinterested third party. So there's a third party who does not care what's inside the vault. They only care about solving these puzzles. So, so, so Bitcoin introduces a puzzle. And all these people solve this puzzle as fast as they can. And it's, it's the first person to solve the puzzle opens the block. And they get a bunch of Bitcoin. These are, Bitcoins are, are states of energy. They don't exist. They're nothing. They're, 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 they have no mass. I mean, they're electrons. I mean, seriously. Um, but that's what people are fighting for, the possession of these tokens. These tokens represent that productivity. So then, as soon as that happens, the next puzzle comes down. Everybody starts fighting for those as well. So the Bitcoins have to have value in order for this thing to keep going. It's a pretty strange setup, but you have that disinterested third party is essential. And that's called the validator. That's where the math gets daunting, and we'll talk that, about that some other time. But just trust me that, that this, is, this is how uh, it's going to work. So these vaults are very, very useful because you can put things inside the vault. I could put my contract to Joan inside the vault. I could give it to her. The vault, she can only open it. I can no longer open it. So that's very useful. These handshakes now among ourselves in a, in a design-build environment are, are very useful. So um, do you always need a blockchain? Is this the sol solution to all our problems? No, it's not. Um, in fact, there's a lot of really, really great technologies out there and databases that, that do most of what a blockchain can do. And, and, and if you don't need all eight of these things, you probably don't need a blockchain. So there's a lot of hype going out there. It's, it's, for, for an advocate of blockchains to come up here and tell you why you don't need a blockchain, it should be testimony to the fact that you know, we're serious. You know, there are reasons why you don't need one of these things. It's not the, it's not the solution to the world. Um, but you, you need to have most of these, or not all of these, before you need a blockchain. So I'm going to go through each one of these really, really quick. First thing you need is the, you need to want to share a database. The problem is that databases don't talk to each other. Um, and there's two solutions for that. One, you develop an API, which is an application protocol interface, which allows you know, Amazon to talk to your bank and your bank to talk to, you know, you know, the, the, the delivery people and so forth. Um, and then, or you could all share one database. So here's um, two databases, they don't talk to each other. Here's what happens when you put them together. Um, they still don't talk to each other, but now you have to kind of, you know, build all these little different interpretations between them. So this could represent an engineering firm uh, and a, a, a contractor, a subcontractor, or the database for, uh, for the G GC, I mean, so you know, look at it. I'm not, I'm not in your world, so I don't. Uh, I only know the engineer's point of view. But um, imagine this as that your bank trying to talk to your insurance company, trying to talk to, you know, it's pretty clumsy still, and and that that's the problem. That mistakes can be made in those interchanges. Um, so the idea is called decentralization, where everybody shares a single database. Okay, so you want to have to be in a situation where you need to have a shared database. That means you have to have a lot of people interfacing with the same set of data. Um, you need to have multiple writers. If you don't have multiple writers, you don't need a blockchain. So if you're a corporation, you want to put a blockchain inside your company, you really don't need it because you know who everybody is. You don't have the, the requirements. And it's really not a very good database. I mean, I mean Salesforce.com is a superior CRM. It's a, a magnificent. And it could do most of the stuff you needed to do. Um, uh, so blockchains are a technology for multiple writers. You need to have multiple people writing to this database. Um, absence of trust doesn't mean there's a bunch of bad guys running around. Absence of trust means that you don't need to have to question the individual who's communicating with you. Like in, inside the corporation, they've got a badge. You know that they've been vetted. You know they've taken the drug tests. You know all that before you can eat, and you, you're confident you can transact with them because you know they're from the same company. Um, but blockchains are a technology for multiple non-trusting writers, so people you don't know, people who you're not checking their badge, you're confident that the system has, has let them through the correct door because those, those rules have been set up. Um, so do you need a way for people to be assured that the person you're transacting with is who they are and say, say they are, that's my typo. Um, this intermediation, this is going to be hard for a lot of people. Um, what, what blockchain does is it removes the trusted third party. So in a bank transaction, your bank is that trusted third party. And you can ask them really nicely if they'll let you, you know, modify the database, and they won't let you. Because, you, you know, they won't let you. You can ask really nice, it's not going to happen. But in a blockchain, that does happen. There is no central control. 
Okay, this could be very challenging for the general contractor to cede a certain amount of control to this computer program. Okay, this is, can be a little bit spooky. Um, but so do you want to eliminate the broker? Is there, is there a cause for that? Um, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. And this is something that needs to be determined on an individual basis. Um, transaction interaction. Blockchains are really good when two transactions depend on each other. And I mentioned this before, critical path. Um, if, 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 uh, um, if Alice sends some funds to Bob and then Bob sends the funds to Charlie, the funds to Charlie won't happen until the funds from Alice have hit. Okay, so this is scripted into, into the blockchain. So you get that, that's how a critical path works. You, you don't begin, you don't, put the, you don't close the wall up until, until the plumbing's installed. I mean, these are, these are basic things, but you'd be surprised at how that, that gums things up sometimes when one crew is waiting for another crew to come on board and, and things like that. So they really shine where you want, where you have a lot of these sort of transactions happening. Um, you want to be able to set the rules. So if one through five are true, then you probably require a set of rules that must be embedded which restrict certain transactions from being performed. And, and you know, this sounds a lot more, you know, if you think about a corporation, you've got all these things in place. You've got managers to vet people. You've got all this hierarchy. You've got a lot of things that do these jobs already. And now you're seeding this to a computer program. You have to be, you know, understand what the thing is, but also how to use it, how to make this go to your advantage, how to program this thing so that those same rules are now um, uh, applicable to the database. And one and, and set of rules doesn't mean constraints so much. It means more like um, the total quality, for, for example, accounting, the total number of dollars going in has to equal the total number of dollars debited from another account, debited from another account, or else somebody's being corrupt. So those are the types of rules. So you can double check things by the number of, of valves that are installed versus the number of valves that were delivered you would be able to, if, if there are less valves delivered that are installed, then the, the, pro, the program would stop and tell you, and you would have an issue. So it's a very handy tool, but in the wrong hands, if it's not done correctly, it could be problematic. Um, pick your validators. It's it, the blockchain's job to be the authoritative final transaction log. Um, this is a very complex subject. In, in Bitcoin, the validator is called a proof of work. That's You've proven that that work has been done. That's what validates the new block. There's other types of ways of validating blockchains. We won't get into it. Um, we use something called a proof of stake, which means uh, that the, 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 the blocks are randomized between individuals. So I don't know, everybody's got a copy of the blockchain, and I don't know which one of you is going to publish the next blockchain. So I can't, the next block. So I can't corrupt you unless I corrupt half of you within a short period of time. You know, you, this is the, the math kind of starts getting a little daunting. This is a lot of game theory and so forth. But you can kind of see how that works. So you want to make sure that the trusted party is the trusted database is from a trusted validator. Um, so assignment of responsibility. Once that thing has made its decision, you need the GC to come out and say yes, everything has gone great. Now I um, I validate that this is a correct blockchain. Everybody has to be in agreement that this is the right, um, uh, this is the right outcome. So design build community must accept the rules of the blockchain and no disputes can extend beyond the, the database and you cannot go backwards. So, gosh, I hope I didn't send you off, on, off the cliff on this stuff. Um, it's really still, at the end of the day, the clumsy little dance that a computer has to do in order to simulate what humans have been doing for hundreds of years, thousands of years. So don't lose track of that. It's not new, it's just a simulation that does stuff. And, it'll, and, and it's, it's efficient because you're replacing um, human error with this immutable uh, database. Um, it's a three-trick pony. It acts like a check valve, one-way flow commitments. It's like a clock which synchronizes everything in time. It puts the entire project on a certain cadence. So um, we'll talk about how this, how this, how this attends to some of, the, some of the problems that you're experiencing in design build at, at, towards the end. Um, and it's an immutable, audible, permanent lecture, uh, uh, permanent record. So if something goes wrong, you can always audit the entire trail of everything that happens to find out where it did go wrong. This is another problem with design build. It's another problem with, with building maintenance. When was something actually replaced? When was uh, some change made? 
if you can audit these things and you change the incentives of people who write to these contracts. If you write to a contract knowing that nobody's ever going to find those drawings, it's a different, it's a different moral hazard than knowing that this is a, an audible trail and that you are held accountable. Um, so here's a reality check. Um, the reality of the construction site are things are really complex and messy. Um, things never go as they're planned to go. Um, it's impossible to write a script which portrays everything that's going to happen on a construction site. People show up late. There's traffic jams. There's, there's um, all the contractors, they, they're trying to get an eight-hour shift, even though it's an eight-hour shift. you got somebody watching the money, and you got a superintendent shifting people around to do different things, different jobs, different tasks. Is this really, um, is it really practical to have, every time you change something on the script, you have to have a computer programmer there to change the blockchain script. That doesn't really sound very efficient. It, it might not be. Your superintendent is a very important person. They act as a referee. They're like the traffic traffic cop. You go here, you go there. And it's people skills. And, and your computer's still not going to be able to pull off the people skills. So is this something that's practical for, for construction? You know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, but we've been studying this for a while, and we've been looking at what is the sweet spot, at, at, what, at what granularity would blockchain be beneficial to our business as engineers. And we, we determined that it's best acting at the points of risk transfer. Now these are very easy to identify in a project. Where does the, tra where does the risk transfer from one party to the next party, contractually? or in any other form. So there's going to be a, a risk, a transfer of risk from the owner to the contractor, from the contractor to the subcontractor, between our, our architects and engineers, between the contractor and the owner, and between the bank and the owner, between the bank and the insurance company. These are all contracts that are going to be occurring uh, at a point where risk or money, which is basically the same thing, are transferred from one party to another. So this is the place where a blockchain would probably be the best fit, in fact, it would be an excellent fit um, because th that's what would be driving the major components of these events. Your, so your superintendent is driving towards the event where he, is, he or she is no longer um, in charge of that asset or people are driving towards that event where the shift is visible to everybody and, and everybody understands what's happening and they do whatever they need to do to get there. So that is what we identified. Um, and, that's, and that's very much what the engineering stamp does. The engineering stamp is the point where the risk is transferred from the architect to the owner or from the architect to, or the engineer to the architect or, or to the contractor, to the builder and so forth. So this is what we've, um, we've identified as being um, the sweet spot for blockchains. Um, so how do engineers intend to use um, this blockchain? Um, well, first of all, let me talk about what engineering is, who engineers are. Um, I interpret engineers at this point as makers of useful things because, you know, there's plumbers who know just so much more than I would ever know about how things are put together. And I, you know, I, I specialize in, in a lot of, do a lot of plumbing issues. So I respect these guys a lot and these girls a lot. Um, engineering is, is something that's been, lit, we've been segmented into different professions. We've got a, a regulatory body which, which manages, you know, our, 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 the, the profession. Um, but before all this happened, before there were universities, they were just makers of useful things. In biblical times, uh, the engineers were the, were the uh, masons and the carpenters. Okay? So, so we, we do respect that the makers of useful things are the people um, that, these, that, these, that we're treating, we're trying to treat, we're trying to get on, on, the, on the table. Um, but the engineering stamp seals a data set. The engineering stamp finalizes the work under responsible charge. The engineering stamp converts a design um, of a design or a structure into an actual asset which can be converted to a financial instrument, uh, hypothecated or, or done or built into mortgages or done anything. So the financial industry can't touch it until it's been stamped and the certificate of occupancy, for example, has been issued. Um, so the engineering stamp is tied to finance, insurance, and law in a very intimate way. So this is what we're looking at. How do we, how do we um, make that tie more durable? How do we make it more... Um, uh, robust. So the NSPE white paper that we wrote makes the argument that the, the PE stamp is remarkably similar to the way Bitcoin are produced. The, the professional engineer solves a puzzle, they stamp the item, that closes the vault, 
next vault opens, and so forth. But in a way, everybody does. In a way, the, the superintendent is working on a, on, a, on a hit list. Everybody's got the same thing going on. So, so that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Um, so the next question is um, the cryptocurrencies. What's, what's this cryptocurrency thing all about? Um, the tokens, like I mentioned earlier, the Bitcoin, if the Bitcoin didn't have value, then nobody would try to solve those puzzles to run the blockchain. So it's kind of a reverse thing. It's not that the Bitcoins do have value, it's that if they didn't have value, then this thing would stop. So the value of a Bitcoin is going to be proportional to all the things you can do with Bitcoin um, that you couldn't do without Bitcoin, which is a really, really strange avenue towards tangible assets, <laughs> if you want to know the truth. That, that is really weird. I mean, all the things you can do with it that you can't do without it is a different, really a different way of measuring value. Um, but we found that these tokens, these, they're, they're like breadcrumbs. And they tell you where you've been. They can measure events. You look at the distance between two tokens dropping, you can see how long that occurred. You look at the rate of change of the tokens as they're being distributed or where they're being distributed. It gives you a lot of business intelligence as to what is happening on that construction site or with that group of people. It's a measurement device. It's, it's a thing that measures the immeasurable, the intangible value that all of us create when we're talking to each other, when we're working on, on the, on the uh, construction site. These tokens, they memorialize those. And it's a way of incentivizing a certain aligning incentives, aligning uh, behaviors in a very, very interesting and unique way. It's not punitive. A lot of times today we have, if you don't do it, you lose your PE stamp. If you don't do this, you don't show, you lose your job. You, so you're, everybody's working in, to a certain degree in, in a state of fear. But if you remove that state of fear, that state of competition, um, of hardcore competition, we shouldn't be competing with each other. We should be collaborating. Okay, if you remove the incentive to, to cheat or to, to compete, you would remove the incentive to cheat. It's not to say that people are cheating, but there is moral hazard. And it manifests in many, many subtle ways. But if there's a way to incentivize a new set of behaviors, that seems to be the big benefit of how do you align people? How do you get these decisions made? How do you get these conversations had? How do you get these agreements finalized? How do you get them to, to work together? If you have this incentive, it's out there. So if design build creates value in transactions, we can track the value through those tokens. So what the co-engineers did, this is the co-engineers blockchain that we developed at IEBC. Um, they're really easy, I mean, this isn't rocket science. I mean, blockchains are not rocket science, unless of course you're rocket scientists like some of us. But um, it's really a simple plan. What happens is an engineer makes a claim, or any individual makes a claim, and they receive a token. They don't quite get it yet. Another, and another person has to come and validate that claim. And then they get a different token. So one's called mass, one's called gravity. So the first person makes a claim, the other person validates the claim, and they get these tokens. And then what happens is that transaction is recorded on this ledger. Okay, so this is how it works. Just a, a, a simple progression of these small little transactions. So what happens is, as this continues, and these, 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 uh, these um, transactions are registered on a, on a mutable